Over the last 50 years, intervention in a woman's pregnancy, her labour, her birth and her breastfeeding have increased phenomenally. There's a cascade of intervention that occurs and it's, the cascading's been happening for quite a long time but more recently it's, it's even developing further into the fact that women are being told they're going to be induced at 39 weeks. Why? Why would we be inducing a baby that hasn't reached its gestational age? Why would we be putting women to the risk of ending up in the operating room because we've started with intervention in labour? Why are we doing these things? We really have to ask these questions. For example, the use of the Cook's catheter, a balloon inserted into the cervix and blown up just beyond the cervix, blown up. My question is why are we dilating a cervix like that when, you know, if it's 39 weeks or why are we rupturing membranes at 39 weeks? Why are we inducing labour unnecessarily? Of course there are times when it's appropriate to, for, for, for various reasons, to, to rupture the membranes. It's absolutely appropriate. But that's a very small percentage to the, to the percentage that's happening in women now in, in the hospital system. So why are we rupturing the forewaters? Because when we rupture the forewaters, we alter the hydraulic pressure for the baby. We, off, we alter the, buffers, the buffer that helps the baby's head descend. And every time the baby's head comes down onto the bony pelvis, the buffer helps. If the membranes rupture spontaneously, that's totally different. But to put your fingers in and use an instrument and break the water, is that necessary? Why are we doing it? because every time the baby moves then the water around the baby leaks out too. So then we've got the uterus pressing on the baby and directly onto the baby and that is most painful for the mother. The, the baby's head directly on the cervix is most painful for the mother. So then what we do is we give them opiates. We give them an epidural. We put an epidural in and we give them synthetic drugs, synthetic opiate drugs into the epidural space. And then she's numb. So she doesn't feel the rest of her labour. She's not guiding it herself. She's not working with her baby. So then we're standing over her, instructing her what to do and how to do it. So my questions are so many of them. Why do we do this to women? Why do we lay a woman flat on her back? And the other thing that, that, that happens when we, when we um, anaesthetise the, you know, the, the maternal body so she doesn't feel anything from mid-body down to her legs is how does she deal with you know, the baby coming through the pelvis when she's flat on her back? The diameters are less because, the, the, because of the pressure on her sacral spine. The pelvis is not opening like it would normally if she was off the pelvis. And then she gets to the stage where her baby's on the perineal muscle. And when her baby's head's on the perineal muscle and it's flexing to come down, and she doesn't have the sensations, so then the team are standing around her telling her when to push. You know, and sometimes she pushes under instruction. Um, if not, she might have a vacuum put on the baby's head or she might have forceps put on the baby's head because she just can't make that effort work for her. She's not mobile, she's not moving. The movement of the pelvis helps the baby descend. The opening of the pelvis makes the baby descend. There's a, a, the contraction of the uterus regularly at her pace makes the baby descend. There's a, the whole connection is for her to give birth, but that's interrupted when she's been given uh, her labour's been accelerated when she's been given opioid drugs and when she's flat on her back. Many more perineal tears occur when we give women instruction to push if we work with them under their own power and we, we stay in tune and rhythm with them. We're working to help her move that baby gently over the perineal muscle, not to force it over the perineal muscle because then we end up cutting an episiotomy or she ends up tearing. So we've got one complication after another, after another, which could be avoided. Why do we stand over her? Laying her flat on her back means we're compressing the uh, sacrum. We're not allowing the sacrum to rise. So when she's on her feet, 
or she's on her hands and knees, the pelvis is moving. Once she's obstructed on a bed, it prevents the pelvis from moving. So her labour is much, much harder, much, much longer. So then what we do is we put a drip up and we put synthetic oxytocin in the drip to pole drive the baby through. That's my language, of course. But that's how I perceive it. I perceive it as the baby being pole driven through the maternal pelvis. So I'm asking all the time, why are we doing this? Giving birth belongs to the woman. The midwife is beside and with her. It's not about taking over her body, changing the, the momentum of her labour, changing her, her pelvic movement. What we do in hospital is quite different. If she's not doing it in our time in the hospital, not in her own time, if she's not doing it within the time parameters that we've put on her labour, then we accelerate her labour in every possible way we can and it's a cascade of intervention of accelerating her labour. So that's another very traumatic time for the mother. So one transition into the other is quite traumatic and generally over that time we see also nipple trauma, breast engorgement, sometimes early mastitis because the baby's not able to feed properly. So these are the things that I really like to work with women in their pregnancy if possible to start preparing them and to and to also focus in all of that in the birth planning and the breastfeeding planning is to focus on the importance of the first breastfeed and the first 72 hours unhurried uninterrupted untouched in that time and unless there's an urgent situation there's no need to do anything but the midwife will be carefully observing the mother and her baby she'll be watching for blood loss she'll be talking to the mother about her uterus contracting and retracting and and uh, and she'll be talking to the mother about her breastfeeding talking with her uh, hopefully beside her and not standing over her because that's a dominant position know your rights know your strengths know your wisdom and make people aware of that. So as a midwife with 45 years experience, I encourage you to be well informed, to understand what is being offered to you and why. Ask all the questions, document what you need to, and prepare your birth and your breastfeeding plan in the way that is instinctively right for you you will be advised, and of course it's common sense, if things go outside the normal range or the expected normal range, there may be other suggestions and that's part of asking questions as well. Lots of questions. Mm -hmm.